Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm the author of the Tanyuan Academy series, and this is English Nerd. So today I wanted to tell you about 25 classics that you can read in a day. Now, to be fair, a lot of these you can read in a day. If you read as quickly as I do, which is kind of medium, then some of these would take you two, but they are really short. All of them are um, some of the shortest classics that you can read that are not only impressive literature, but also will be accepted on some things like the AP exam um, open question. So since that is coming up on May 4th this year, I wanted to give you some short options so that you can read some classic literature and have that fresh in your mind. Or if you're just a new reader of literature and you're not quite sure where to begin, here are some places to begin that are not intimidating. This is not War and Peace. This is not Brothers K. This is um, not Les Mis. This is something else. So here are 25 classics that you can read in a day. Okay, so the first one is one of those two-day books that I talked about, but it's still really short. It doesn't actually cross the threshold of what we would consider a novel nowadays because it is um, so brief. So Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury is the story of a fireman who in this society sets fires instead of putting them out. And he is essentially the uh, censor for society who has said that books are too controversial. And so in order to keep the peace and keep everyone pacified, he burns all of these things. But then he has an awakening and starts to realize that perhaps he shouldn't be doing that. <clears throat> Number two is The Great Gatsby. This is a heavy hitter as far as American literature is concerned um, by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So it's the story of uh, the great Gatsby, Jay Gatsby, who owns this magnificent house and throws these magnificent parties like you may have heard of, Gatsby parties, right? And all these people come. It's set in the 1920s jazz age. And he does all of this in order to woo his former lover, Daisy, who lives right across the water from him and so his efforts are all pointed that way. I'm not going to give away what happens in the story but that is the setup of The Great Gatsby. It's another two-day book. Okay next we have One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This is literally the story of one day of your average Joe in the Russian gulag. So this is from the perspective of of somebody in the gulag written by somebody who spent eight years there himself trying to expose the evils of what was going on um, in Russia. And so this is a book that's meant to be able to take you a day just to simulate what that experience was like start to finish. So it's an easy read, but it is dark. So there's that. Okay, next we have famously The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. As you can tell, this is a very, very short book um, by Robert Louis Stevenson, of course, about a man named Dr. Jekyll, who also has this alternate personality through different mysterious science experiments called Mr. Hyde. And so you have the different sides of mankind being presented there and the problems of having a side to one that is just completely the id, the animalistic, the instincts. So that is that. Okay, next up we have Henry James' The Turn of the Screw. This is a gothic, I mean, it's, it's a novel, but is it? It's, it's not even 100 pages long. It's another one that's very, very short. It's about a governess who gets hired and mysterious things start happening in the house where she is working. And it's one of those, uh, it, the narrator is deliciously unreliable. You're not quite sure what's real and what's not. And so the whole thing is kind of a ghostly mystery. Um, and the ending is really what you're, what you're there for. So if you wanna talk about the ending, you can just let me know. 
Okay, next up, we have some Dostoevsky. So I mentioned Brothers Karamazov before, that was his magnum opus, that was super long, but he has some shorter works as well that are definitely worth a read. So if you want an introduction to Dostoevsky that is not something intimidating like that or Crime and Punishment, then you can try Notes from Underground. It was the first book that I read by him and it's very philosophical, but sometimes I really enjoy philosophy and so this was right up my alley. It's split into two parts. Part one is basically the diary of this man who lives in the underground. He's never named, so we just call him the underground man. And he talks about how he lives just for spite and the different ways that he doesn't want to conform to society. And then the second half is how that plays out in reality. We actually see him at his job, we see him interacting with some people, and it's uh, a bit rough. Personally, I like the first part more, but the second part is very illuminating. They kind of complement each other. Okay, next up we have Shakespeare's Macbeth. I, as much as I love Hamlet, I feel like that is not the best introduction to Shakespeare unless you have a guide to kind of take you through. Instead, Macbeth is very, uh, as far as Shakespeare goes, it's easy to understand, easy to follow. It is his shortest tragedy as well. It's fast paced. There is magic and murder and mayhem. Basically, it is about Macbeth and his wife, Lady Macbeth, who cannot be ignored, who are, uh, Macbeth gets a prophecy that he is one day going to be the king of Scotland and his wife interprets this to mean, oh okay, the king is coming to stay with us, we must kill the king to become the rulers of Scotland. And so the story begins. Um, it's, it's a pretty wild ride, so Macbeth, it's a good one. Okay, next up we have Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. This is not as long as it looks, this is both um, volume one and two, so Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass um, with illustrations. So it's essentially half of this. Um, I assume that you know what Alice's Adventures in Wonderland uh, is by Lewis Carroll. It's Alice and she falls down this hole one day and she ends up in this very, very trippy alternate reality where identity is very flexible and so are many other ideas of distance and direction and uh, just everything you could possibly imagine. But this definitely is a classic and if you are an AP student out there and you're wondering, yes, you can use Alice's Adventures in Wonderland for the open question. Just like any other work though, you have to be specific. You can't talk about the Disney movie and think it's going to be okay. You have to know the stuff. So there you go, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Okay, next up we have a graphic novel, Mouse by Art Spiegelman. It's a very famous modern retelling of the Holocaust from a Jewish perspective, but it's told, uh, basically it's the author's father's story. Um, and so you have this kind of double lens of the relationship between himself, fictionalized as this younger mouse, and his father, and kind of difficult relationship that they have as the younger mouse is trying to find out what happened to his father during the Holocaust. And then most of it is the father's story about how um, Poland became under Nazi control and what the steps were and the people that he met. Um, and those, the Nazis are, are cats. And so you can get the obvious symbolism there, but it's impressively done. It's really very sad. I mean, you, you think it's a, it's a graphic novel, um, Many people associate cartoons with, some, with something being light and, and even happy, but um, it, it's easy to read, so in that sense it's light, but content-wise, brace yourself. Okay, next up we're going with The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This obviously doesn't look skinny, but I didn't have The Hound of the Baskervilles outside of a massive collection. <laughs> Um, that is my favorite Sherlock Holmes novel, and it is, again, a very short novel. Many of you probably know the story, but Sherlock Holmes is called away because there is this story of a mysterious dog, a huge dog that's haunting the moors and attacking people, and people think it's a ghost, and, and Sherlock needs to figure out what is actually happening 
on the moors is it haunted or is it something more human and more sinister so i would recommend that one by the way all of these that i'm recommending are books that i've read so um uh, there were others that I wanted to put on the list for the sake of more um, different voices and ages and things like that, but I just wanted to recommend things that I knew personally. So I know that there are lots of other books that could be added to this list. And if you know some, please put those in the comments below. But again, these are ones that I, I have read myself, so I know how long they are, I know what they're about, all that kind of thing. Okay, next up we have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead by Tom Stoppard. This is a retelling of Hamlet that is a postmodern play. It goes really quickly, as most plays do, and it has a lot of the same themes at, um, as you see in Hamlet, but it is definitely this kind of postmodern, is there meaning, is there identity, how do we forestall despair <laughs> sense throughout the whole thing and yet it's really funny even though we know what's going to happen at the end so i enjoy this play i've met people that feel a little ambivalent about it but i i enjoy it it's the last thing that i read with my ap seniors every year because we still have to meet in class after they take the exam so there's a, a week week and a half in there where you know we just read this play kind of as a last hurrah Okay, next up, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. This is an anonymous poem. It says uh, Burton Raffle, but he's just a translator. Um, I, you can go with, with any translator you like. However, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, I think, is best digested if it's actually in verse, as it was in initially meant to be seen. There are a lot of prose versions out there, but the, the verse is good. Um, I'm not a big fan of Tolkien's. I know, considering the massive banners in the back, you'd think that I would be, but he prefers this very archaic language, which kind of makes sense. He was a philologist. I just don't think that it flows all that well. So um, Raffles translation is fine or anybody else who meets those that criteria. So anyway, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is about Sir Gawain or Sir Gawain, some, some people call him who is a member of the Knights of the Round Table when, when King Arthur is still a relatively young king. So they're all celebrating Christmas together in this big feast and into the hall rides this green knight. He's massive, he's riding a green horse, he's carrying an axe in one hand and a holly bob of peace in the other, so very mixed messages from this green knight. And he proposes that they play a Christmas game and the game is like not a game, it's I strike you, you strike me with with this axe, um, and things go not as you would expect. Sir Gawain obviously is right in the middle of the adventures there, but um, yeah, very short. I mean, so much of this, this book even is introduction. That's introduction, that's poem. Okay, next up we have Lord of the Flies. This is a two day read for me at least. It's short but today. Lord of the Flies by William Golding is a beautifully lush uh, written work about these British boys who get stranded on an island after an airplane crashes and they have to survive on their own. All the adults are dead. And so they uh, try to create some kind of civilization, but it inevitably falls to pieces, order disintegrates. There are two camps that form. We have Ralph's camp. Ralph is our narrator. He is the more level-headed everyman type. And then you have Jack's camp, which is flashy, but they're all about, you know, violence and power and having fun and not being responsible. And so the, the boys kind of take sides and that's the setup for Lord of the Flies. Uh, such a famous work and for good reason. Okay, next up. We have The Little Prince, which is just a delight. Very short, again, as you can see, and this one has full page illustrations. So it's just a, a little gem. And it, like, I don't know how uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, I'm not sure that I'm saying that correctly. I don't speak French, but I'm trying. Uh, I don't know how he did it. Because the story, like if I set the scene for you, you're going to say, that sounds really dumb. You're even going to look at the picture and go, that also looks kind of dumb. 
but I've talked to a lot of people who feel like it's 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 almost not like reading it's like having this kind of spiritual experience reading the little prince okay so the setup is this we have the little prince he lives on an asteroid with a rose and he eventually decides to go on a journey and he meets all these people and ends up on earth um, where he meets this this pilot that went down in the desert that's kind of the setup for this story it's so unusual and so beautiful at the same time there's a chapter that just about makes me cry and I'm like what is happening to me <laughs> why is this the way that it is so yeah highly recommend okay next up if you want to go more the classical route you know this this stuff is old but maybe you want to go with something older <laughs> then you can read Oedipus Rex or some people translate it Oedipus the King which is just what Rex means by Sophocles this is um, at the time the ancient Greeks would have these tragedy competitions it was considered this fine art um, perhaps even more than it is today and Oedipus the King won one of those competitions and continues to be the gold standard for ancient Greek tragedy so the setup for this one is that Oedipus is the king of Thebes and there is a plague that has come upon Thebes. There's some kind of curse and it has to do with this man who was killed. And so Oedipus tries to get to the bottom of who killed this man, who brought this curse upon his own city. And as much as I hate spoilers, everybody who originally watched Oedipus Rex would have known the big twist and it's so much easier to appreciate what's happening in this story when you also know the big twist and you're just dreading it and so i'm gonna tell you you can always skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't if you want to go in blind so oedipus when he was younger there was a prophecy that said you're going to murder your father and marry your mother so of course his parents took these precautions um but oedipus as a baby survived these measures that his parents took to avoid such a horrible fate. And so Oedipus grew up not knowing who his real parents were. Um, he becomes the king of Thebes and it's true, he does murder, he's the one who murdered the guy. He murdered his father and he's currently married to and has children with his mother, but he doesn't find that out until he looks deeper into this mystery. And the timing, like, it's so horrible because you know that he's going to figure this out. And as it slowly starts dawning on him and the things that people say, the timing is almost comedic in how over the top it is. Um, just the, the timing's hilarious. So if you're feeling like something really pretty weird, Oedipus <laughs> Rex, I didn't like it as a ninth grader when I first read it. I thought it was hilarious when I was 23 and I reread it. Okay. Um, sticking in the classic, classical era vein, um, the trial and death of Socrates. Very short. So this this comprises um, three different dialogues. This is the Apology, the Crito, and the Phaedo. Um, these were written by Plato, but they talk about um, you know the trial and death of Socrates as the thing says, and I don't need to explain. These are some of my favorite Socratic dialogues. And as far as philosophy goes, it's some of the most digestible because it is a dialogue back and forth. The only exception is the apology, which is not Socrates saying he's sorry. It's the speech that he makes, that Socrates makes in his own defense when he's accused of corrupting the youth. So he has to go before this tribunal and he gives this speech. It's like apologetics. Um, it's a speech in his own defense. He doesn't apologize for anything at all. Um, and then he's famously sentenced to death and it's really beautiful the way that, that all of that unfolds. So if you're interested in dabbling in ancient philosophy when that has felt really um, intimidating before, this is a great, great place to start. It's, uh, it's not not that difficult to understand. It's better than, say, um, The Republic, which is much longer and um, more political, and you get these nuggets in there, but this one is short and good from start to finish. 
Okay, next we have Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. I know it's a children's classic, kind of like The Little Prince, but it definitely is a classic. And although my book is huge, it is mostly pictures. I mean, you have these absolutely breathtaking <laughs> full page spread um, illustrations. And the original is nothing like the Disney version. It's it's um, darker. It's more adult. It, it surprised me when I read it how much I loved it. Because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the movie. I thought it was just okay. But this is really fun. It's really fun. So um, I'm going to assume that you pretty much know the, the story of Peter Pan, the boy who didn't, who didn't grow up and lived in Neverland um, and takes Wendy and Peter and John with him one night. So yeah. Very nice. And this version is the prettiest. I spent some time researching and Scott Gustafson, he has the best illustrations out there. So those are the ones that I own. Okay, so these are ones that I don't necessarily own. That's uh, why I'm not going to be holding up these, these books. Um, next is another play. I find that plays are really quick and they can be fun to read. So this one's a comedy. It's The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. It's understandable. It's laugh out loud funny, even if you are not familiar with the characters already. It's pretty easy to keep them straight. And it is just a classically hilarious play from uh, technically the, eight, the late 1800s, 1895. It's the story of these two men who both go by the name of Ernest but only when they're in town or in the country, so they kind of flip-flop. And the hijinks that ensue when they're both in the same place at the same time is... Uh, it's you, you just have to check it out for yourself. It is funnier than I'm making it out to sound. Um, so the next one is not half as funny. <laughs> um, in fact, it's very, very somber. It's The Death of Ivan Illich um, by Tolstoy. It's, it's very, very somber. It's The Death of Ivan Illich. Um, by Tolstoy. It's technically it's a Russian short story, but Russian short stories can be like hundreds of pages long it seems like and it's literally just the story of this one man's death. So it's very somber and it's meant to be sobering and the way that he dies is not something that is grand and it's meant to make you contemplate your own mortality. I'm more a fan of Dostoevsky than Tolstoy if we're gonna go with the battle of the you know russian authors from the 1800s but that one was a, a good gateway into tolstoy if you want to move on to something meatier like anna karenina for example okay after that the heart of darkness by joseph conrad is perhaps a two-day read it's pretty short and it is it is dense just giving you a heads up it is really dense it's about this guy named Marlowe who goes into the African Congo during the time of um, colonialism and it's a, it's a grim picture. Um, he's trying to track down this guy named Kurtz who disappeared in there and the, the resolution is very surprising, very haunting, and a, just a horrible indictment of, of colonialism some really famous lines in there that you might recognize even if you haven't read the book. Okay, next one is also pretty dark, but we're going American now. And that is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. Steinbeck is known for massive works like The Grapes of Wrath or East of Eden. But if you want to try something of his that is significantly shorter, then Of Mice and Men is perhaps for you. It's about these two, um, I think they're, what's the proper name? For them they go they go from farm to farm trying to find work like my no share crop no migrant workers I'm, I'm blanking on the actual term but they go from farm to farm and it's the story of this friendship between a guy named George and a guy named Lenny Lenny has a pretty severe disability but George and Lenny have always been there for each other um, George helps keep Lenny out of trouble and Lenny's very grounding for George and so it's the, the story of the two of them and um, they do end up getting into some pretty significant trouble and it's a, 
It's a dark, sad book. I'm just going to tell you right now. Okay, let's lighten things up here for a second. Uh, Around the World in 80 Days. I think that's Jules Verne. I will double check. But Around the World in 80 Days is a book that I haven't read for a long time, but I remember really enjoying it. It's short and it's about a guy named Phileas Fogg who makes a bet that he can make it around the world in 80 days without air travel or anything like that. They set all these rules and he needs to take off from London and return to London within that time frame. And it's about all the the adventures that he has while he's on the road. And so that one's um, that one's quite fun and it's you know a lot of a lot of traveling. Okay, next we have a couple of stories that are more horror centered. So I'm not a big horror reader, but I have read these and um, enjoyed them. So we have The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. That one is the story of this house that is allegedly haunted and somebody who wants to study the house because it has such a fearful reputation. So he gathers this group of different experts and um, scholars and things like that to help him do experiments on this house and investigate what might be going on. And it's just, there are creepy things that happen when they arrive. It wasn't as fast paced as I was expecting it to be, but it was, it did have creepy moments and it's a horror classic. So if that's your, if that's your thing, Shirley Jackson is the one who wrote The Lottery, the short story. So if you read that one in school, um, it's the same, the same writer. Okay. A, I guess you could, you could call it horror. I found it creepier than Haunting of Hill House. Um, the Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman is, I prefer it. Um, it's a diary style story about a woman who is suffering from what seems to be postpartum depression. Uh, but in a time when mental illness was not really dealt with or not dealt with well, certainly for women at the time, it was just the idea was, oh, you're simply weak and you have to rest. But for this particular woman, that is not, not the best way. She ends up getting this absolute morbid fixation on the wallpaper in the room that she's not allowed to leave. And it just gets creepier and creepier. It, it talk about an unreliable narrator. I like the yellow wallpaper more than Haunting of Hill House and more than Turn of the Screw. It's both shorter and creepier and just more engaging to me. So that one is fabulous. Technically, I think it counts as a short story, but I believe I've seen it on those AP lists, you know, that you get after the open question. Okay, and then at the very end, we have a seasonal favorite for anybody who's watching this a little bit later when it's not springtime if you want to get into dickens but again the the size of a lot of dickens books like david copperfield or tale of two cities feels kind of overwhelming then read a christmas carol get a get a sense of his style I mean, we all know the the story, right? Ebenezer Scrooge, he's visited by three ghosts on Christmas Eve so that he can change his ways. But the the style is very uniquely Dickens and it's a fun holiday read. So there you go, 25 classics that you can read in one day or at most two. If you can think of any more, please do put those down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe for more English nerdy goodness. Good luck to those taking the AP exam. And uh, that's it. I'll see you next Monday.